Legend has it that on the outskirts of Manila, in a sprawling slum called Peatas, there lives this vicious monster. And wherever this monster goes, it spreads sickness and suffering among the people, spreading toxic chemicals and disease in the land and water. In the 90s, this monster grew, feeding off the trash that Manila produced. And it grew to a height of 15 stories at one point. Some people noticed this growth and tried to do something about it, but most people just laughed and said, oh, you're being silly, calm down. The monster isn't any bigger, stop worrying. But the monster had grown, and eventually it struck. On July 10, 2000, the Peatas monster made its violent descent on 300 people, eating them all alive. Now, this story sounds unbelievable, but it really did happen. Granted, the Payatas trash monster is a personification of what is really the Payatas landfill, which, after weeks of heavy rains on July 10, 2000, suffered an avalanche that ate 300 people alive, burying them, shattering thousands of lives. Following this, the government of the Philippines began forcibly relocating people to another town about 45 minutes away. The story of the trash monster is something that the students children of these families that were relocated came up with to describe what is the inconceivable, that you could be buried by trash. It's a way for them to relate this story to us in a way that we can understand. And this summer I went and worked with a group of these students to help them tell their stories. And the story of how I got to the Philippines begins a while ago actually with last year's TEDx McGill conference when a good friend of mine introduced me to an amazing man. His name is R.C. Maliari and he's a Filipino who is here at McGill studying how to create a more engaging educational system for these disenfranchised students in the Philippines who had been relocated. R.C. was here in Montreal and he was working on a way to teach kids about the world, to teach them about everything, policy, geology, ecology, politics, everything about the world, by looking at what comes out the other end, what we don't value as a society and what we throw away. I was amazed to hear R.C.'s stories of the Philippines and these mountains of garbage. I was more amazed after having been a student of the environment for two years at McGill that I had no idea what it would feel like to live in a trash dump as Arcee had done in Payatas for three years. I had no idea the global scale of this waste crisis that we were dealing with. And at the same time, through these conversations, I learned that Arcee was just beginning to discover some of these amazing and innovative waste management practices already here in place in Montreal. Groups like Food Systems McGill, Gorilla Composting were completely foreign to Arcee and they really excited him. And so Arcee and I got to talking, and one of the first things I learned was just that, that I had, I had no idea about any of these things. And so through our conversations, Arcee and I got really excited, and the thing we got excited about was taking this joy that the two of us felt, sharing our cultures, a Filipino man and a guy from North America, from the US, and, and that exchange, and we wanted to to translate that into this curriculum that we were trying to build for these students. And the way that we decided, the idea behind that was that, you know, if the two of us can learn this much from a simple coffee break, imagine what could happen then if we were to connect entire classrooms of students from both Philippines and Montreal to share, to discuss, to collaborate, to work on these issues through their own methods. And so then we met with the St. George's School of Montreal and we began what is now the U.S. Dology Project. We won the McGill Dalai Lama Fellowship and we decided that the best way to initiate this project would be monthly Skype meetings between the two schools, where the students would swap films that they'd made about their experiences of waste in their community and what they were doing to combat this. In between the Skype sessions, kids would go on with their normal environmental science classes, but would be constantly making films about what they were learning and about what was going on in their community, as well as designing hands-on projects to combat that. And uh, well, the e-wasteology name, Iwasto in Filipino, means to fix or to make right. And wasteology is obviously as corny as it is, the study of waste. So together it's, it's kind of a study of how, how this cycle of waste occurs on a global scale as well as how we can work to combat it on a local context. And this video is just you know, completely raw, uncut samples of the films, all shot by our students in the Philippines and Montreal. So it's kind of a, a window into their perspective as this went on. And so that brings me to my time in the Philippines. I went there for two months this summer with Christian Elliott, who you heard from earlier, and we taught these students multimedia skills, video journalism, digital storytelling, how to take their experiences and translate them into something that could be sent across an ocean, essentially. 
And since then, we've only had three Skype meetings, but the projects that the kids have come up with since then and the relationship that's developed has been absolutely incredible. Just as I was enthralled by RC's descriptions of these mountains of garbage in the Philippines, you can see and feel and practically hear the jaws dropping among the St. George's students as they watch videos created by their Filipino counterparts depicting their trip to the Peatas landfill or local waterways contaminated with industrial and human waste. These slack jaws quickly transform into toothy grins as our St. George's students hear about things they never expected. Organizations like a facility in Payatas that takes trash, that takes bottle caps, magazine pages, and turns them into marketable materials, accessories, purses, jewelry that's sold overseas for hundreds of dollars. These students had no idea that this could ever exist. And then it's back to St. George's turn to share. The students in the Philippines were amazed to hear about vermicomposting, something they'd never, ever conceived of. And at the same time, they were, they were astonished to be given a step-by-step -step guide to do-it-yourself water filtration, you know, involving activated charcoal, a series of filters, and some water bottles. And through this series of cross-cultural collaborative discussions, the kids have come up with several waste reduction projects that they're working on right now. Using insight from a video recorded trip to the Concordia compost facility, our students in the Philippines have begun collecting food scraps from their school, which they'll soon turn into composting fertilizer, which will be used as a community garden tool to provide vegetables and spices to offset their school's uh, food system fees. At the same time, these students have taken their stories using facts about the Peatas trash monster and designed the story that I actually told you about at the beginning of this talk. This was not a legend that pre-existed. This is a story that these students came up with when given the task of translating their experiences into something that's relatable. And they're using that story not only to share with us, with the world, but also as a way to share with their peers. The students in Montreal have taken this story and turned it into a series of children's books as a way to relate the dangers of overconsumption to their elementary school peers. Our Filipino students are taking this story to the elementary school and teaching these students about what it means to cut off this monster's food supply, how we can't let this monster get any bigger. And so that's the story of my time in the Philippines and, and you know, the experiences that I gained from it. But what's interesting about this story is that it has nothing to do with what I taught any of these students, and it has everything to do with what I learned from them. And this is what I learned. The first thing, is that everybody has a story to tell. Right from the very beginning, by stopping and listening to Arcee, when I definitely should have been doing homework, listening to his stories about the Payatas Mountains, I was able to gain a new and fresh perspective on the world, something I never would have encountered in my normal daily routine. At the same time, some of these students have actually taken it upon themselves to take this project one step further, using the tools that we've given them to tell their own stories, They've talked to their grandparents and gathered this rich cultural heritage in the Philippines and taken pre-existing myths and folktales and created videos about them and created their own website to showcase these that can be found on the internet. It's amazing, really. And the second thing that I've learned is that it's when you get these groups of people with varying backgrounds and different worldviews together in the same room, it's that collective mosaic of perspectives that brings out the best ideas in the world. To quote a good friend of mine, Albert Einstein, you cannot solve a problem using the same mind that created it. And I think that's absolutely true. And I mean, this is something that we've all experienced in our day-to-day -day lives. You know, just sitting, staring at a puzzle for hours on end, looking for the missing piece. And then, you know, your roommate comes in maybe, and two seconds, boom, they found it. It's not because they're cleverer than you. It's not because they're smarter than you. It's not because they've done that puzzle a hundred times. It's because they have a fresh perspective because you'd been so ingrained in that problem, in that puzzle, in that one-dimensional view of what you were trying to accomplish that you couldn't see that opportunity, that new perspective lying right in front of your eyes. That's the second thing I learned. And the third thing I learned is that true learning and development is never confined to the classroom. The only way to grow, in my mind, is to engage with people and worldviews apart from yourself. And this is something that's, you know, hardly revolutionary, that we can, you know, we should be stepping outside of our social circles. It's something people have described many times before, but it's something that's constantly overlooked, and it's something that can be applied anywhere. In our educational systems, we should be working to create programs like eWestology that work with cross-cultural collaboration. In our government, we should be holding more open forums that allow everybody from multiple perspectives, minorities included, to voice their opinions on an open playing field. I'm tired of hearing 
from old, rich, white men who created all of our problems, give me their solutions to these problems that they've created. You know? And in research, especially where you know, we're all academics, we're here at McGill, we should be looking both to scientists and farmers. We should be looking to teachers and students, indigenous knowledge as well as technical expertise to solve these pressing global problems. And this is something that we can all work on in our personal lives too. Next time you're at the bus stop, next time you're at the metro stop, next time you're in the supermarket line, look to somebody that you might not normally talk to, somebody who looks different from you. Actively seek them out. Strike up a conversation. Because in the end, you'll never know until you try, and everybody has something to share, and we all have more to learn. Thank you.